Thank you. Um, in Plantation Poker, The Merkin Stories, uh, Canadian Caribbean visual artist Jocelyn Gardner alternates quotations from the diary of Thomas Thistlewood, the infamously cruel plantation manager, with in lithographed engravings of pubic hair, suggestive of 18th century pubic wigs called Merkins. The pubic triangles, featuring Afrocentric braiding and weighed down by instruments of torture, appear as illustrations of Thistlewood's documentation of his sexual exploitation of female slaves. Several sets of red quotation marks establish an explicit dialogue between word and image, and a full stop brings the entire piece, nine lithographs and seven pieces of text, to a close. I will consider what I call the auto-ethnographic -ethno weave of this work, as well as the role of masking in, in connecting the 18th to the 21st century. Through direct quotations of the colonizer's words, meticulous lithograph visualizations, and a disconcerting ambiguity between word and image, Gardner mimics the aesthetic techniques of works that accompanied and legitimized the Anglophone colonial endeavor, endeavor driven by uh, faith in science, progress, and the pursuit of knowledge. By engaging with what Mary Louise Pratt calls the idiom of the conqueror, plantation poker, the Merkin stories, enters the territory of autoethnography. In vulnerable states, bodies of memory in contemporary Caribbean fiction, Guillermina de Ferrari develops this concept, defining autoethnography as an attempt to redefine collective identity by appropriating both the scientific assumptions and the overall imagery originally deployed by Europeans in their attempts to represent the natives as colonizable people, and in doing so, to expose the political under underpinnings of those metropolitan scientific and cultural conceptions. In her article, The Artist, uh, in Subverting a Caribbean Natural History, her article, the artist Gardner explains the intentions and inspiration for the Merkin stories. Despite the fact that she does not use the term autoethnography, she describes the pro approach over and over again. Quote, uh, her work critiques 18th century documentation commonly used to inscribe difference on colonial bodies and identities, end quote. These are some of the words that she uses throughout the essay to describe her <coughs> approach. Gardner, the artist, mimics, alludes to, and questions the 18th century practice of cataloging curiosities and displaying them through etchings, engravings, and lithographs as specimens for examination. The Merkin Stories lays out meticulous lithograph engravings of disembodied pubic triangles braided and weighed down by instruments of torture and oppression, such as whips, spurs, and shackles. The, test, the text that accompanies the images only increases the horror and confusion, which is fitting since the relationship between image and text in natural histories of that period, according to Gardner, was ambiguous, maintaining enough mystery to inspire both curiosity and fear in the reader. Gardner's engravings are placed alongside uh, excerpts from the diary of Thomas Thistlewood, who detailed daily events on a Jamaican sugarcane plantation between 1750 and 1786. It is considered the most extensive doc documentation of sexual exploitation of female slaves under the plantation system. Through his analysis of the diary, Mastery, t Tyranny, and Desire, historian Trevor Bernard portrays a mercilessly cruel plantation manager that was, at the same time, an avid reader and an amateur botanist and horticulturalist, engaged with the latest literary works and scientific and philosophical debates from the Metropole. The diary includes documentation of purchases for his personal library, his exchange and discussion of books with other white Jamaicans, and a lengthy lament after the death of fellow botanist and horticulturalist of the island, who. Thistlewood noted with admiration, had Linnaeus almost by heart, and was well acquainted with the work of Sloan, Ratsby, Edwards, etc. The Merkin engravings precise, uh, subvert precisely this drive to understand and dominate the world around, uh, around oneself, expressed in the aesthetic techniques of these natural histories, studied and written by colonial elites. The Merkin engravings are placed in explicit dialogue through the use of quotation marks and a full stop with excerpts from Thistlewood's diary related to his emotional, physical, and sexual abuse of the women under his control. The collection of quotation mirrors the ambivalent tone of the diary as a whole. If we take a look at uh, a close-up of the bottom row, 
we see, uh, threw away the ivory fish given me by Elizabeth Mitchell. Elizabeth, uh, according to Bernard's analysis, uh, Elizabeth M Mitchell was a woman that Thistlewood had courted in England before being rejected by, his family, by her family. This quotation is sandwiched by a dark braided pubic triangle with spurs and a lighter unbraided area pubic uh, triangle with a cross shaved into it. The next set of quotations includes a description of when, where, and how he had intercourse with two slave women, including that he paid one of them a small amount. This is followed by the incredibly horrific documentation, the most uh, horrific of the entire work, uh, of the punishment Sally received after her es attempted escape. The final panel includes an entry from a month after the punishment describing intercourse with Sally in Latin as not good. No matter how mundane or horrific the event, the consistently dispassionate tone establishes an overall atmosphere of disregard for women and appalling abuse of the, of the women under his control. The instruments of torture enter, an, enter into an obvious dialogue with this asphyxiating atmosphere as a con condemnation of the abuse. At the same time, the artist suggests that the quote, painstakingly braided hairstyles and suggestively phallic placement of the implements of torture serve to embody the imagined female body, end quote. The disembodied pubic triangles also evoke merkins, pubic wigs normally worn by prostitutes in the 18th century to cover venereal disease, uh, thus suggesting further connections with sexual exploitation, lasciviousness, one of the ethnographic justifications for sexual exploitation of one of black slave women and the veiling of social ills. While the powdered hair wig of the 18th century was an attempt to insert oneself into the social hierarchy, the merkin communicated the social order imprinted upon the prostitutes. Braiding phallic instruments of torture and this allusion to the merkin form a double gesture that denounces exploitation of all women while empowering or making a claim for opacity. The right to opacity is a concept developed by Edward Glissant as a response to what he calls the compulsion for transparency, an intellectual gesture that seeks to grasp or pin down meaning, such as what we see in the natural histories mentioned. Building upon these concepts, De Ferrari points to the vulnerability of the body as the site for this claim for, for opacity. She states, quote, the contemporary Caribbean subject lays claim to its own materiality as a disidentification with the traces imprinted upon the body. The vulnerability of the body thus becomes a condition of the possibility of emancipation from colonialism at the cultural and social levels." End quote. The Merkin stories openly display traces of this symbolic colonization imprinted on the body, yet Merkins are also wigs, pubic wigs. They are meant not only to cover, but also to be covered by clothing. The Merkins simultaneously reveal and suggest layers of concealment. It is hopefully clear that the Merkin stories are intentionally unclear, inhabiting a space of ambiguity and making visible the limit between exposure and obscurity. What can we make of the other half of the title, Plantation Poker? I suggest that not only does Thistlewood's dispassionate tone resemble the meticulous documentation of natural histories, but that, considering the information conveyed, it is also sadistic and flippant. It relates a sexual game in which Thistlewood abuses, tortures, and rapes women whenever he desires, in which the only rule is that he does as he pleases and none of the women under his control can refuse him. Plantation poker, the Merkin stories, equal terms joined by a colon. Gardner sees the perverse game and meets or counters with the Merkin stories. In this sense of the game, the Merkin store is as a wig is a wig as a wig is similar to a mask that recalls carnivalesque disguises, inversions, and subversion. The Merkin ask mask, woven through with African uh, Afrocentric braids and instruments of torture, mirrors the perverse, unsettling tone of Thistlewood's game. In masking in power, Jared Aching explores the ludic yet potential nat political nature of the web of contact that the mask embodies in colonial and post-colonial Caribbean culture. Aching understands 
masking as not only mimicry or repetition, but also as a process that is improvisational, in which Caribbean subjects simultaneously demand visibility and challenge the perceptions of the audience. Two, in Aching's words, achieve shifts, whatever their degree of perceived tangibility, in local power configurations. Aching uses an example from a 19th century travel account of a Brit British traveler observing a carnival celebration in Cuba to illustrate this playful yet political masking. Fascinated by a black man that had painted his skin black with ink and suit, reddened his lips and smeared his clothes with tar and cane juice, the traveler, the British traveler, reflected upon the motivation and consequences, consequences of such a disguise. He noted that not only was the man not as black as he was painted, but that there, was all, that there also existed another world and another population blacker still. For Aching, this encounter illustrates how the mask is used to react against the ways in which unwilling subjects have been misrecognized. The result, then, is a distorted mirror that denounces misre this misrecognition while simultaneously causing the unexpected and undesirable uh, self-recognition of the observer. In this encounter, the traveler was confronted with his prejudices in the face of social and arbitrary nature of race. Who then is the audience of Plantation Poker the Merkin stories? What might the local power configurations be? And in Aching's terms, who and what are demasked here? Gardner has expressed post-colonial feminist intentions in relation to this work and others of exposing the violence of colonialism and patriarchy, identifying the differences that have united and separated women, and encouraging solidarity. The Merkin Stories not only critiques the extreme violence faced by women enslaved on Jamaican plantations, it also makes reference to the exploitation of prostitutes, as well as the expectations placed upon elite white women, as we saw in the engravings of the light brown hair marked by a cross. Patriarchal society labels women as licentious and dis demands purity and chastity of elite white women and sexual exploitation of poor and black women. The Merkin story suggests that poor and rich, black and white, women assume the Merkin in response to colonial patriarchy, emphasizing the continuities among women and exposing the differences, exposing difference as constructed. This work was exhibited in Ontario, Canada in 2012 as part of a solo exhibit entitled uh, Breeding and Bleeding. Gardner's position in the larger post-colonial narrative was addressed in uh, a review of the exhibit called Not the, for the Faint of Heart. Gardner, as a Barbadian expat, speaks of her white heritage and her need to address her country's violent and repressive history through her art. She points out that she is a visible minority in her homeland but here in, Canada, here in Canada, she is seemingly part of a cultural majority. However, this implication sits uncomfortably on her shoulders and has led inevitably to the subject matter which distinguishes her powerful work. Gardner developed a consciousness of her position. She experienced an ideological demasking upon moving to Canada and becoming a part of the cultural majority. Dissociation and white culpability are driving themes of her work alongside post-colonial feminism. Who then is being demasked in this scene of the Merkin as the mask? Gardner cites abolitionist literature among the many ethnographic texts with which the Merkin stories engages. Quote, the semi-pornographic implications of the pubic triangle as fetish for scopophilic consumption also reference illustrations of slave torture found in abolitionist literature such as Stedman's narrative of a five years expedition, where tortured semi-undressed black bodies reveal the horrors of slavery while simultaneously titillating the reader. This voyeuristic violence reveals the extent of symbolic colonization that persists even in the discourses that sought to end such dehumanization. The also in Gardner's statement refers to the fact that the Afrocentric braiding and defiant phallic placement of the instruments of torture at the same time serve to empower the imagined female body. To add yet another also, I believe that the semi-pornographic implications furthermore speak to a 20th and 21st century consumption of the Caribbean. How might the Merkin stories be seen in an age 
when Caribbean has become synonymous with exotic be beach vacations uh, that seem to infer sexual permissiveness and even include Afrocentric braiding. Does the combination of braided pubic hair and the suggestion of sadomasochism on some level titillate, titillate the contemporary viewer as they understand uh, the message from the 18th century? In Consuming the Caribbean, Mimi Scheller traces the unequal relations of power and mobility established during, the 17th, during 17th century exploration that persisted in discourses of 18th century scientific collection, 19th century travel writing, and 20th century cultural representation. Scheller does not merely look to contemporary sex, and tour sex tourism and transnational agriculture. Rather, she implicates the international art and publishing industries readers and spectators, and even herself as a specialist on Caribbean culture in this post-colonial narrative. She insists that one must constantly assess whether they are consuming the Caribbean, Caribbean culture ethically. As we consider the American stories as a work of art displayed internationally, or as the focus of this analysis, perhaps it will expose us as cultural consumers of enduring symbolic colonization. A privileged spectator of the 21st century, despite being aware of and condemning global inequalities, might at the same time see them as deeply ingrained, difficult to overcome, and therefore even natural to some degree. We cannot ignore the parallels over the centuries, so we must question the relations of power that position us to be able to say and do as we do. The American stories holds up the distorted mirror that has overdetermined colonized subjects to both colonial scientific discourse of the 18th century and to the post-colonial spectator of the 21st century. Although this is a powerful reading, this interpretation is still too univocal after we have attempted to listen to the multi-directional tensions and polyphonic meanings made possible by this work. As we have seen, the weave of the Merkin stories finds itself pulled in different in the directions of Merkins worn by prostitutes, sexual abuse meticulously documented by Thistlewood, the form and content of colonial ethnographies and natural histories, the illustrations of abolitionist literature, and even contemporary practices of sadomasochism and Caribbean tourism. The vertig vertiginous reach of symbolic colonization demands that we give the attention necessary to explore these connections, never settling into an absolute reading. The work the auto-ethnographic work weave of the work only exists through these connections. Plantation Poker, The American Stories, thus makes its enduring claim for the right to opacity.